Wentworth are in a captive situation in prisoners. Cell Block H here on Carlton tonight at 11.40 after Network First. years old and I was traveling with my father and my brother and my brother had his little boy three years old and we were traveling to go to Scotland. I was just 12 and we were going up the gangplank. Dad said to me, bend your knees because I was very tall and then you look smaller and you look younger. So I got through a half price. All I could see was a great big monster ship. It looked a monster. Well, it was a monster. Well, I was four years old then. I was ending my eighth year when I boarded the Lusitania. My father had deserted us and my mother decided that perhaps it would be better if she went back to her parents in England. And that's why she sailed on the Lusitania with six children. I don't think she even knew that it was in danger. Did you know that it was filled with contraband? There's been some cover up about that Lusitania. It was really murder, really. On May the 1st, 1915, the Lusitania, one of the world's biggest and fastest ocean liners, left New York bound for Liverpool. She carried 1,265 passengers and a crew of 694. But there were rumors of a far more deadly cargo. Munitions needed by the British for the war against Germany. On May the 7th, 1915, she reached the southern coast of Ireland. Soon after lunchtime and in sight of land, she was hit by a single torpedo from a German U-boat. Moments later, another, much bigger explosion rocked the vessel. The great ship listed sharply to starboard and began to sink bow first. In just over 15 minutes, she disappeared beneath the calm, flat sea. Nearly 1,200 men, women and children perished with her. Never before in naval conflict had so many innocent lives been so cruelly ended. Overnight, England was cast as the helpless victim of a ruthless German foe. In the United States, outrage at the loss of American lives helped draw the country into the war on Britain's side. But even as the stricken ship settled on the ocean floor, bitter controversy raged. Was the Lusitania as innocent as they claimed? Had the British Admiralty secretly used a passenger ship to carry high explosives? 
worse. Had the Admiralty, led by a young Winston Churchill, deliberately exposed the ship to a U-boat attack to help draw America into the war? Whatever the truth, one thing is certain. When the Lusitania sank, she left many unanswered questions in her wake. In the summer of 1993, ocean explorer Bob Ballard, the man who found the Titanic and the Bismarck, set out to unlock the secrets of the Lusitania. Vital clues have lain hidden for almost 80 years, 300 foot down, off the southern coast of Ireland. The Lusitania is one of those great unsolved mysteries. Well, the mystery is, why did the Lusitania, which was really an auxiliary heavy cruiser. I mean, it was really well built, much better built than the Titanic. Uh, had many more compartments. Why did this ship sink so quick? I mean, the Titanic hit an iceberg and was opened up for 300 feet and it took hours to sink. Yet the Lusitania was hit with one torpedo and sank in less than 15 minutes. Uh, why? The controversy has its roots in the unfolding drama of the First World War. In the spring of 1915, Britain and Germany were locked in fierce fighting on the Western Front. The British needed munitions. The only place to get them was across the Atlantic in the United States. But the Germans had a terrifying new weapon, the U-boat. Still a gentleman's war. If ships were threatened, crews were allowed to abandon them before they were sunk. But then Churchill raised the stakes significantly and in so doing put the Lusitania in mortal danger. British merchant ships were told to carry concealed weapons and attack any U-boat that stopped them. The German response was swift. All waters around the British Isles were declared a war zone any British ships found there would be sunk without warning. Churchill welcomed the German move. Three months before the Lusitania was sunk, he wrote of the importance of attracting neutral, especially American ships into British waters in the hope especially of embroiling the United States with Germany. For our part, he went on, we want the traffic. The more, the better. And if some of it gets into trouble, better still. This is all one case. All one case. The Lusitania mystery is a complex technical puzzle. Everyone agrees there were two explosions. The second, far bigger than the first. Everyone agrees the first explosion happened when a single torpedo hit the hull, but the cause of the second devastating explosion is still a mystery. Documents from the official American inquiry are stored in a New York archive. 18 fuse cases and 125 shrapnel at the time, Britain officially denied the ship was carrying highly explosive military supplies. Today, we know different. 303 British U Mark 7, 174 grain bullets. This is what they're admitting to. Winchester repeating arms. But bullets and shrapnel aren't explosive enough to sink a large ship. Seals. A1. One widely held theory is that the Lusitania had a far more dangerous cargo. Bombs, highly volatile gun cotton, or even TNT. If so, it would have been stored here, in the forward cargo magazine, the precise place where the torpedo struck. 
the resulting explosion would have destroyed the magazine and maybe sunk the ship itself. Either way, evidence of massive damage would still be visible on the wreck. The Irish Channel, 13 miles south of the Kinsale Lighthouse. Bob Ballard's research vessel, the Northern Horizon, positioned over the spot where the Lusitania went down. Ballard had with him the same team and much of the same specialized equipment he used to track down the Titanic and the Bismarck. This time, he knew where the wreck was, but not what caused it to sink in minutes. I sort of view what we're doing as investigative reporting. We're going out now with a, an extremely advanced technology that has never been available before. And we're going down and uh, something else happened. And what was that something else? Was it because it was carrying war materials, as the Germans claimed, and the torpedo struck a lucky hit and ignited those war materials, vindicating what action the Germans took? Or was it for another set of reasons? And the solution is, where's the hole? How big is it? And what was it caused by? Ballard was not the first to dive on the ship. In the past 30 years, other expeditions had reported finding a gaping hole in the bow on the port side, directly opposite where the torpedo found its target. But Ballard had technology his predecessors could only dream of, state-of-the-art equipment like Jason, the underwater robot, that allowed him to survey every inch of the vast hulk. He planned to photograph the huge hole and provide new and convincing evidence that something blew up in the Lusitania's forward magazine, something the British authorities had always denied. Okay, there's the side of the ship. We're gonna rise up. 10 meters to the west. The Lusitania lies in 300 feet of water on her starboard side, the side hit by the torpedo. Ten. Okay. Idea, ten meters west of Jason. There's the top already, Will. It's not far up. Are you popping pictures, team? Okay, there's the beginning of the name. There's the L. U, S, there's the I, the T, A, N, I, A. There she is. Almost 70 years earlier, on the day the ill-fated Lusitania set sail, the German embassy placed a notice in New York papers warning, travelers intending to embark on the Atlantic voyage are reminded that a state of war exists between Germany and Great Britain and that travelers sailing in the war zone on ships of Great Britain do so at their own risk. Cunard thought the Lusitania too fast to be threatened by a submarine. Winston Churchill, though, cabled a friend advising him not to sail. Nine-year-old Edith Williams was traveling with her mother and five brothers and sisters. No, I don't think she even knew that it was in danger. If she did, she certainly kept it quiet. No, we never knew anything about it. No.
We left New York on the 1st of May, 1915, on the Lusitania. Father, mother, brother, baby, sister, 20 months. And myself, Every time the Lusitania sailed from New York, it was a glittering social event. This time, starstruck spectators might have caught a glimpse of millionaire Alfred Vanderbilt. On a dockside swarming with German spies, the ship was loaded with last-minute provisions, and hidden among barrels of cheese were rifle cartridges, fuses, and 1,250 cases of shrapnel. I can't believe they'd be carrying arms in a passenger ship. Because it was, it was the, well, it was the largest ship then, and it was all wealthy people going back and forwards from Britain to America, you see. They should have been very careful about that sort of thing. With 1,257 passengers on board and its secret cargo of munitions, the Lusitania set sail on its final, fateful voyage. Ballard's investigation was now underway. He was looking for the enormous telltale hole that would confirm a massive secondary explosion in the forward magazine. But when Jason's cameras did pick out the ghostly form of the bow, it seemed intact. Seems like I need to come left. As Jason moved slowly over the exposed port side, more damage came into view, but it looked like it was caused by 75 years of tides and corrosion. In one place it was definitely bowed out, but it looks like someone took a pair of scissors. Yeah, yeah, I see all that. Yeah, it's a mess. We can see the extent to which it's really been flattened and squashed. Uh, we can tell that instead of being uh, maybe 80 or 90 feet off the seafloor like we could expect, it's only about 30 feet. Soon, Jason's cameras detected smaller holes, but they were nowhere near the magazine where the explosives would have been stored. Let's come back to the northwest. I'm turning. Here we go. At the very bottom of the bow, a large section was missing, but again, it was well forward of the magazine. So we were much further forward than we yes. thought. But there was no big hole in this neck of the woods. No, but there was a lot of damage in this area. Right, right. A lot of pop rivets, shell yeah. plating just missing. But again, it also could have, damage could have been part of the impact. Okay. So Ballard was confused. The images from his underwater camera told him the gaping hole reported by earlier expeditions simply didn't exist. A widely accepted theory about the mysterious fate of the Lusitania had suddenly collapsed. Bob Ballard's detective work had hit a dead end but if the magazine hadn't exploded, what was it that had caused the Lusitania to sink so quickly? First and foremost, the magazine did not explode. I'm confident of that. I, I went right in, thumped up against the hull. I couldn't add my hand of the vehicle more than uh, feet from where the magazine is and, uh, and the armament. Uh, the munitions. Uh, I would be led to believe that uh, whatever they put in the forward cargo hall didn't explode. It's not what I had hoped. It's not pretty. 
and it makes our investigative reporting that much more difficult. Plus, she's laying on her starboard side. <laughs> That's the side where the torpedo hit. That's where the answer to the mystery is. Wednesday, May the 5th, 1915, a German submarine, the U-20, commanded by Captain Walter Schweiger, surfaced just south of Fastnet Rock. The sub had left Germany the day before the Lusitania sailed from New York, lured to the area by false signals from the British Admiralty about troop transports arriving from Canada. Early U-boats moved very slowly. For them, even the slowest ships were hard to catch. Captain Schweiger's crew took every chance to escape the stale, acrid air below deck. A thousand miles to the west, passengers aboard the Lusitania were enjoying the Atlantic in somewhat more comfortable surroundings. She was an opulent floating hotel, 785 feet long and 88 feet wide. Seven decks towered above the waterline, three more below. She could cruise at over 25 knots, but on this, her final fateful voyage, the number four boiler had been shut down to save coal. On the bridge was Captain William Turner, a veteran seaman who'd served 32 years with the Cunard Line. Her four immense dining rooms handled 10,000 meals a day. Her first-class kitchen rivaled the best in Europe's capitals. There was a library and a doctor's surgery. There were even lifts between decks. And a two-story atrium in the elegant first-class dining room capped by a spectacular dome. A floating palace, someone called her. Alice Lines was 18 years old at the time, a nurse in charge of a three-month-old baby called Audrey. It was just a gorgeous ship. It was like traveling in a hotel. We had dances, we had lovely meals. There was no talk of war at all with anybody. The only thing I remember fairly clear, every morning, uh, Dad got me up early and we walked all around the Lusitania. It was good and we had a very calm voyage, no sea sickness. One thing I remember about the Lusitania was there I had my first drink of cold refrigerated milk. It was now the evening of May the 5th. Since she'd left port, the U-boat had sunk one ship, a schooner loaded with bacon, but she'd had to use deck cannon and grenades after a torpedo had jammed in the firing tube. At 8.30 p.m., Captain Schweiger spotted a steamer through the fog. He fired one torpedo at point-blank range. This time, it cleared the tube, but didn't explode. The U-boat's action was reported to the Admiralty in London. It came as no surprise. They'd been monitoring its signals since it left port in Germany. The following day, May the 6th, the Lusitania sailed into British coastal waters, and into the war zone. Lifeboats were swung out from the ship, though few thought they would be needed. Captain Turner was back on the bridge after a brief visit to a cocktail party given by Alfred Vanderbilt. He found a telegram waiting for him. Submarines active off south coast of Ireland. Minutes later, 
a second message arrived. Avoid headlands. Pass harbors at full speed. Steer mid-channel course. Submarines off fastnet. Captain Turner ordered the curtains drawn in all staterooms. Gentlemen wanting an after-dinner cigar were advised not to smoke it on deck. The night before we were torpedoed, the, the steward came into our, my room and drew all the curtains. And I said, what's this all for? And he said, well, that's my orders. After dinner, the Welsh choir gave a concert. In the first-class smoking room, a fight broke out amongst a group of high-spirited young men playing cards and Edith Smith took a stroll with her mother. On the deck one time she said to me, she did say this and I remember it, that if we're to be drowned, let us hope that we'll all be drowned or all saved, something to that, probably in prayer, she said it. That's all I remember about my mother. A few hundred miles away, Captain Schweiger congratulated his crew on a good day's hunting with two cargo ships sent to the bottom of the sea. The ship's gramophone played tunes from Wagner. And then Schweiger took a decision that would change history. With three torpedoes left, he decided to stay in the Irish Channel looking for troop transports and merchant ships. Ballard's detective work had so far made little progress. Something must have caused that second fatal explosion. But if it wasn't the munitions that blew up, what was it? Ballard decided to find out for himself, with the help of Delta, a two-man submarine. He approached the wreck along the line the Lusitania followed as she sank. The way was marked by a trail of coal. Coal. The Lusitania carried 5,000 tons of it in massive bunkers along both sides. And those bunkers were directly behind the damaged munitions magazine. A tiny clue. But for Ballard, perhaps a crucial one. It meant the coal bunkers on the starboard side must have been open to the sea when the ship sank. Friday, May the 7th, 1915. It was almost one o'clock and after slow progress through heavy morning fog, the Lusitania rounded the southwest tip of Ireland in sight of land. I was six years old and we were standing on the coast of Southern Ireland off the old Hedekin Sail on a lovely sunny afternoon enjoying the scenery when we saw this liner coming round the corner. I'd never seen such a big liner as this in my life before. And uh, we were fascinated watching it coming towards us virtually. Wonderful sight. It was a fine day. Yes, it was a fine day. And that morning, Dad, when we come from breakfast, Dad said, look out there. And he said, can, what can you see? That was the Irish coast we were on.
Fifteen miles away, U-Boat 20, on the surface, spotted four funnels on the horizon. Though his submarine would have no chance of catching the unidentified liner, Captain Schweiger gave the order to dive. On the bridge of the Lusitania, Captain Turner ordered a turn to port towards Liverpool, unwittingly putting his ship directly in the path of the U-boat. Schweiger couldn't believe his luck. In the ship's dining room, the second lunch sitting was being served. The liner was now just a thousand meters away from the U-boat and closing fast. At 700 meters, the U-boat fired. We were at lunch, and this girl who shared the cabin with me, she thought we should be starting to pack. So, of course, I left the table and went with her to the cabin, and we were just inside when there was this noise. Oh, it was a terrific explosion, a terrific one. And it sounded as if it was right near to. It frightened the life out of me. The torpedo struck the Lusitania just behind the bridge. A second explosion caused an eruption of water, steam and black dust near the forward crow's nest. All people pushing, shoving, to get up as high as they could, getting near the back. The ship listed sharply to starboard. Lifeboats on the starboard side swung away from the deck. On the port side, they swung inwards, making it impossible to lower them. The lifeboats went up and down, and they were out of order because they couldn't run. They were all crooked. So they had just to fill the boat and lowered it down by hand. And then when they got to the water, they cut the rope. And of course, the first two overturned and the people were thrown in the water. We come to an open space got my hands in prayer, and I said, please, God, save us, please, God, save us. In the growing panic, nursemaid Alice Lines wrapped baby Audrey in a shawl, tied the human bundle around her neck, and headed for the lifeboat with Audrey's older brother. I followed, best I could, to get into the, into the lifeboat, and a, an officer came and grabbed it me and he said, you can't go in, that's full. And I said, I must, my boy is in there. I've just put my boy there, I must. And I got myself free from him. And they were lowering the lifeboat. And I jumped. Terrified of the raging seas, other passengers climbed to the highest parts of the sinking ship. I had my sister Florence with me. We got to the poop deck next to the funnels. And so we were, went down with the sink, and when she got to where we were on the top, we just went into the ocean. My life belt slipped off, and I was holding on to Florence, but I couldn't hold on any longer. I had to let her go. That was very traumatic. That lasted this hand. It was this hand. It lasted till I was 19 or 20 years old. I could still, that's extraordinary. I still could feel the grip. And very gradually, the bows went down. And as the bows went down, the stern came up until the propellers were out of the water. She was quite clear of the water. And at an angle, I would think, of about 45 degrees, she sat poised. And then as if just on the slide, she slowly slid down quite, quite dramatically below the waves. The sea was boiling and um, the liner disappeared.
300 feet down, the great ship came to rest. Trapped inside were those who never made it to the decks. When the ship's power failed, it was plunged into darkness. Hundreds were imprisoned in boiler rooms and cargo holds, in second-class cabins and first-class lifts. The door still hangs open, testament to a last desperate effort to escape. Close by, part of a woman's shoe. On the surface, death was taking a different form. Scattered across a great mile-wide swathe, survivors were dying from exposure in the freezing sea. When I came up, there was nothing in sight at all. The boat was disappeared, and all I could see was heads bobbing up and down, and chairs, tables, and things like that, and people calling out. And these two men were on a, a lifeboat upside down, two of them, and they dragged me on with them. I know I was in the water and crying and uh, being picked up. Just think there were only seven lifeboats, but they grabbed me. And uh, it was Mr. Hook that pulled me out. Dad, he pulled her by the hair and got her into the boat. I didn't see the Lusitania go down, but I seen this row of people moaning. And it was like a half a circle of people moaning in the water. It was just a moaning, constant moaning, and it gradually got less and less. So far, Bob Ballard had discovered that the theories of earlier expeditions on how the Lusitania was sunk didn't match the evidence he'd found. He was now working on an idea put forward by retired Captain Cyril Spur, a British munitions expert who had just joined the team. Spur believed if the torpedo had struck anywhere behind the forward magazine, it would have hit a coal bunker. Since it was the end of the voyage, the bunkers were nearly empty, except for thick layers of coal dust on the floor. How many of those bunkers would have to be violated for the ship to sink the way it did? The Lusitania was built so as to float with two compartments open to the sea, and with more compartments open, she could not stay afloat. What is the explosive nature of coal dust? Is there a gas buildup in these things? Is there it, With a, a disruption, there could be a serious cloud of coal dust, which would be very explosive indeed. We heard a sharp explosion initially, yes. which would have been the torpedo, yes. and a rumbling. That, 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 would, match, that would match a dust explosion more accurately. you still have the classic ingredients for an explosion, provided that you've got a source of ignition. Must have a source of ignition. So you have the torpedo coming in and hitting right about there. Somewhere in that neck of the woods, just below the water line in the red. And you would have had a, an initial explosion, a sharp explosion, which everyone reported. And that would have blown out plating. And then that explosion, that fireball that it ignited, then ignited what I think was the coal dust. It shook, shook the bunker 
got the coal up in the air, the remaining dust, and then ignited that. And so now the sea is going to pour into that area. And the ship is going to immediately list to starboard. Dumping coal on the floor of the ocean as it goes from the ruptured uh, bunkers and then crack on the bottom. Back on the ocean floor, Ballard took samples of coal. Ships of that period commonly used two types of coal. Analysis of the samples Ballard found showed the Lusitania's hold had been full of the most combustible kind. All the evidence pointed to an almost unavoidable conclusion. The Lusitania was sunk by a single torpedo shot that triggered a massively destructive coal dust explosion. I don't think anyone expected one torpedo to sink it. I, I don't think the German skipper that fired it thought he was really going to sink it. And I don't think the captain thought once he'd been hit that he was going to sink. It was just bad luck. And they're on the left hand side. In the Cunard archive in Liverpool, records of the Lusitania tragedy take up only a few shelves. In the haste to find answers and assign blame, the countless human stories were largely ignored. On the evening of May the 7th, the first victims were arriving in the Irish port of Queenstown. And by the following morning, the Lusitania was headline news around the world. In Liverpool and New York, anxious relatives and friends gathered for word of their loved ones. We lost his little sister, 20 months old. I suppose she was drowned as soon as she entered the water, I expect. There wasn't much chance of a little girl like that, was it? The scale of the disaster soon became apparent. Of the 1,959 people aboard the ship, only 764 survived. Cunard offered cash rewards for bodies which were floating ashore as far away as Wales. But only 289 were ever recovered. Of these, 65 were never identified. There were just rows and rows of people who had been taken out of the sea who were dead. I went over quite a number and then I saw my father's body and the uh, that was that. I didn't do any more after that. When we arrived in Queenstown, and they tell me I cried for my mother all night, wondered where she was, and she had a little girl. Naturally, would want to know where her mother was. So they said, oh, she's probably perhaps in another hotel, etc. So, but she was never found like a thousand other people. Sir, the following message is copying ink pen on brown paper enclosed in a bottle was picked up near Waterford on the 18th and delivered to me today. Quote, no other papers to be got, going down with Lusitania, torpedoed off old head Kinsale. M. McManus, goodbye.
In the aftermath of the tragedy, the British government denied the Lusitania was carrying arms. The official inquiry blamed the Germans. In the United States, an outraged public called for a declaration of war against Germany. But it would be nearly two years before the Americans entered the conflict. Ballard's expedition had shed valuable new light on why the Lusitania had sunk so quickly. But one question still remained to be answered. Did the Admiralty, and Winston Churchill in particular, sacrifice more than a thousand innocent lives to bring America into the war against Germany? An exhaustive study of newly released papers relating to the tragedy has been made by historian Simon Rockle. New research has shown you've got to put the Lusitania sinking into a wider context. Churchill and the Admiralty had a number of major concerns at that time. There's a, a number of major operations going on. The Gallipoli campaign being one, that's Churchill's own brainchild. He's put his neck on the line on that. So there's a number of major operations going on at that time. And the point is, these people have been going non-stop for nine months. They're desperately tired. That's Churchill as First Lord and Fisher as First Sea Lord. And they, they've almost reached breaking point. It's more a question of... Um, negligence, tiredness, rather than conspiracy. When you have a disaster like this where so many truly innocent people, I mean, they were innocent children, women, people from neutral countries, had absolutely nothing to do with the war, died. You always want to say, well, who's to blame? Who do we pin this on? And from what I can see, everyone was to blame was not a good performance on the part of the human race. No, I don't think about nothing more about it. It's one of those things and you can't do nothing about it, can we? It was a bad day for we, but I think we was very fortunate in saving four lives out of five. And we didn't talk about it. Even with Dad, we didn't talk to Dad about it. Did you talk to Dad about it? No. No? We said how. Yes, so do I. This is my baby. <laughs> oh, that's right. It's nearly 80 years since Alice Lyons wrapped three-month-old baby Audrey in a shawl and jumped with her into the lifeboat. She's a very dear, close friend, and it means a great deal to me because she saved my life. You did cry a lot. There's no doubt about it. You were a cry baby. My baby, yes. You did tell me that. I mean, yes. That. As a six-year-old boy, it was something that would stick in my mind, as it has done, for the rest of my life. And although time fades and the little grey cells get worn out, I can still sit here now and see that liner just sliding beneath the waves. Oh, I think that... Uh... It still could have a lot of war materials aboard that are undocumented. I think it becomes more and more a footnote, though, as we show that it wasn't the explosion of those war materials that put it to the bottom.
More information about the Lusitania is detailed in a central publication. For your copy, write to Lusitania, Box 96, Birmingham B1 2JL. Please send an A4 self-addressed envelope with 47 pence postage.